Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Blade Artist by Irvin Welsh. Beg B is back. So as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... Jim Francis has the perfect life. A successful painter and sculptor, he lives peacefully with his wife and two young daughters in a wealthy beach town in sun-drenched California. Some say he's a fake, others see him as a genuine visionary. But Francis has a dark, dark past, and when he crosses the Atlantic to Scotland for the funeral of a murdered son he barely knew, his old Edinburgh community expects him to take bloody revenge. When his wife discovers something gruesome in California, which suggests her husband's violent past might also be a psychotic present, things start to go very bad, very quickly. Quickly. So uh, it was interesting to read this one because Begbie is kind of an iconic Welsh character and it's weird to see him kind of at least part reformed in this, you know? So we have this right at the beginning. Uh, the glorious thing about working for yourself, setting your own hours, is that you can always take time off. Jim appreciates being here on the deserted beach so early at sunrise this July morning with his wife and two young daughters while everybody else sleeps off their Independence Day celebration hangovers. The beach is absolutely deserted by some squawking seabirds. And as somebody who's self-employed, I could relate to that. And I've also done a year off booze, so um, Begby by this point, he's sober. And um, so that was kind of interesting to to read that because I you know, can relate to being the only one without having a hangover after a major celebration. So Frank meets uh, Greg, uh, Elspeth's uh, husband. So Elspeth is, is the mother of his some of his kids. And he thinks that Greg looks like the classic British middle manager, tired, harassed, and beset with a crippling awareness that he's gone as far as he's likely to, and that the next big life change will be long off retirement or worse, not so long off redundancy. And Greg says he's always fancied writing the great Scottish novel and that he took a creative writing course once. And we get this. Franco tracks Greg's gaze, taking in the spines of the usual suspects, finding that he's read most of them. They always said I was good at art at school, but I could never see it. I once drew this picture with a black son. The teacher went Raj. A black son, Francis Begby. But I like the idea of a black sun, like a black hole in space. I've gone Irish. Sucking everything into darkness. Where we came from, where we're headed. Or I guess because he's Scottish, where we heeded. I wish it was me, meeting all those stars. Have you read Jennifer Aniston? Best blowjob I ever had. Greg raises his brows, glances towards the kitchen and lowers his voice. Wow, you're joking, right? Aye, she wasn't here that good. We get a nice little sex scene here, which I'm going to read out to you. Because, uh, I don't know, I always find sex scenes interesting. They're very difficult to write well. I think this one works. Melanie felt her mouth open wide, her spine tingle and her palms sweat. Then, under that hanging tablecloth, Jim's hand was on her knee, then crawling like a tarantula up her thigh. Despite this, she couldn't avert her gaze from the couple on the floor. Every beat of music was scored by the flash of a hand, the twist of an arm, the swivel of a hip, while each crescendo was powered by a spin, then two, then three, then four, followed by a pause. And Melanie could feel Jim's fingers up her skirt, inside her panties, probing at her wet pussy for her clit. And almost at the same time, her hand was inside his zipper, undoing the top button on the waistband of his trousers, fastening around his brick-hard cock. She could hear his breathing slow and ragged as they remained fixated on the dancing couple. Jim's inhalations grew shallower still, mirroring her own as they got off on the dance and the style, jazz and sex appeal of the incandescent duo. Wonder what happens when you die, George says. Fuck all, Franco thinks. You cease to exist, that's it. Yeah, I agree with Franco. And this is very kind of current events -y, very American really. Uh, all towns have their bad sides. This one is no worse or better than any other. In California, they lived only a few miles away from where a film director's privileged son had recently gone on a rampage, shooting people dead because he couldn't get his hole. Thank fuck they don't have guns here, he thinks mischievously, looking at poor Spud. That was the um, incel guy who made a YouTube video about it. I can't remember his name. And so someone asked him, So Franco, what's changed about Scotland then? Cunts still have bad teeth, drink too much, take too many drugs. He looks over at Tyrone. They've got fatter, that's what's changed. Larry's face creases in a grin. Like they've no go fat cunts in the States. It was them that started all this fat cunt shite. Aye, it's a global problem now. Franco smiles. I thought this line was very true. Life could get at you through a million cuts as well as one manic plunge. And uh, this is some interesting characterization. This tells you a lot more about Begbie. Unless he was in a blind rage, Frank Begbie usually picked on bullies. Not because he was some kind of protector or avenger. In fact, he hated the sappy cunts who never stood up to them more than he hated the oppressors themselves. He recalls one occasion when, after battering a tormentor, the excitement of the victim indicated he believed that Begbie's violence was undertaken on his behalf, or for some abstract notion of justice. So Begbie then ran the nut on the biscuit earth in order to ensure he knew that the brutality had been purely for his own satisfaction. That he just preferred to ferociously assault tyrants because it changed them more. In his eyes, the sap was already defeated by terror, so there was no real buzz in smashing them. 
But seeing the bully's confidence and power evaporate and bearing witness to that change, that was unfailingly enjoyable. And Franco says, you get what you get, not what you deserve. Which is true life advice. And he wonders to himself, where can you go in Scotland in the evening if you don't want to have a drink? And Begbie thinks, it's important to say the right things, express the correct sentiment. A Prime Minister could quietly protect rich paedophiles using the Official Secrets Act, provided he publicly proclaimed that he would leave no stone unturned to bring such people to justice. It was the expression of the contrary action that gave you the licence. People generally wanted to believe that you meant well. The consequences of thinking otherwise were too grim to contemplate. And Anton, who's a drug dealer, he has this motto, sell drugs, get rich, take drugs, fuck yourself. And I just thought this final bit here I want to share with you. This is uh, Jim thinking about alcohol and obviously he's a reformed alcoholic. Jim was, Jim was reluctant at first, protesting that he hadn't had a drink, looking to the empty bottles of wine on the table. Alcohol had been easier to give up than he'd thought. A couple of drinks were useless to him. He got a mild buzz, then just felt a bit shabby and tired. He always said that you needed loads of drinks, and when you had loads, you lost control, and his loss of control was negatively consequential to him and others, so why bother? But looking at the three of them, cheerfully lit up, playful, he got a little melancholy, lamenting how some people had mastered the art of knowing when to stop. Melanie sensed his envy of them, both recognising a skill he would never acquire. So The Blade Eyes by Irving Welsh, it was a real pleasure to read this one. It was interesting to see Begbie, he's kind of grown as a person, but he still has those same old traits, and towards the end he kind of falls back into his old habits. But he is operating from a place of, like, morality in a way as well. Like, everything that he does, even though it's considered bad and, like, he breaks the law and stuff, he, in his own mind, thinks that he's doing the right thing, so I thought that was interesting. I gave The Blade Artist by Irvin Welsh a pretty strong 4, maybe even a 4.5 out of 5. Did enjoy. I love Irvin Welsh, he's great. So yeah, but that's what I made of The Blade Artist by Irvin Welsh. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.